Hello, my name is Eric J. Lawrence, and I am honored to have been invited to participate in this celebration of Shirley Jackson. I'm a relatively recent recipient of a master's degree in English literature from Cal State Northridge here in Southern California. This comes after having worked in radio broadcasting for nearly 25 years. And while I'm not currently attached to any university and thus operating as an independent scholar, I'm very pleased to return to my first love, academia. This video is a modification of a presentation I gave at the ALA conference earlier this year, examining an aspect of Jackson's work that is often overlooked, her writing for children. I suspect it may introduce some new material to some of you, and hopefully you may find it worth incorporating into your own research into our hero's body of work. But in any case, I'm pleased to make it available for this wonderful symposium. I've titled my presentation, Writing for Demons, Shirley Jackson's Work for Children. In a review published in The Reporter in 1959 titled The Lost Kingdom of Oz, Shirley Jackson applauds the arrival of The Looking Glass Library, a new series of budget-minded reissues of classic children's fantasy literature from authors and editors such as Edith Nesbitt, Andrew Lang, and others. But Jackson also takes the opportunity to lament the fact that contemporary children's literature is dominated by realistic depictions of everyday life, rather than offering young readers an opportunity to revel in the richly imaginative realms authors like L. Frank Baum and Edgar Rice Burroughs created, writing, magic has no place in children's books anymore. Facts are what children are supposed to be reading. In her opinion, this is a mistake, as she states, Writers of imagination and skill will always turn to children first and be thankfully received. Although it took a few years as a professional writer for her to put this idea into practice in her own work, Jackson did produce a number of works written for young readers, and as evidenced by her comments sprinkled throughout her letters, it was a mostly pleasurable and restorative experience. But in typical Jacksonian fashion, she often hinted at a darker side of children, certainly as characters in her more adult-themed work, but also in the kinds of adventures she assumed they wanted to read about. Consequently, by taking a closer look at her books for children in the context of her whole body of work, we can get a deeper understanding of Jackson's perspective on kids, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Despite the recent explosion of Jackson studies, her work for children remains generally unremarked upon, despite the importance of themes of family discord and fractured domesticity inaugurated by the youngest of her narrative's characters in much of her more familiar writings. For instance, Maricat Blackwood, the 18-year-old narrator of We Have Always Lived in the Castle, is a key example of one of Jackson's characters to typify this theme. Joyce Carol Oates, in a 2009 New York Review of Books essay, describes her as in the tradition of, quote, precocious adolescence of mid-20th century American fiction, yet as one who also is a mysterious amalgam of the childlike and the treacherous, a type of disruptive character frequently found throughout Jackson's work. Kids often appear as agents of chaos in much of her adult work. Examples include short stories like Charles, where a young boy relates increasingly shocking incidents about a disruptive classmate to his mother, only to have her learn at a PTA meeting that no such child exists. Even the titles of Jackson's pair of gently humorous memoirs of her life as mother to her four children are telling, Life Among the Savages and Raising Demons. Shirley Jackson is being cheeky here, but they do suggest a bit of an ominous vision as to what exactly children are. But her works written specifically for children provide us with another route to explore these ideas as they shift from the subject of the story to being the readers themselves. Her first such book was 1953's The Witchcraft of Salem Village, a nonfictional account written as part of a series of American history books produced for young teen readers. In her vivid yet factual account, Jackson certainly does not hold back in placing blame firmly at the feet of the girls who were reveling in their newfound power and notoriety. Jackson also wrote a pair of picture books. 1962's Nine Magic Wishes is a fairly traditional story of wish fulfillment, but Famous Sally, written the following year, is a little more troublesome. 
Sally seeks everyone to know her name, so she travels through a series of fairy tale lands, promoting herself until, in the end, everyone does know her and she becomes famous Sally. On one hand, the book works as a story of validation and self-worth that reflects a common anxiety of young children, but Sally is not presented as having done anything to warrant the attention she seeks. Instead, she merely wants to be famous for the sake of being famous, a condition prophetically familiar to us in our post-social media influencer world. The last of Shirley Jackson's completed work for children is a one-act musical play. It is a satire of fairy tales written for her own children to be able to celebrate their wild side. But like with Jackson's memoirs, its title is telling. She called it The Bad Children. Individually, none of these works stands out as a classic or has entered into the canon of children's literature, but they do provide another facet of Jackson's overall body of work, one that complements her more complex and profound stories which explore the conundrum of childhood. Before examining these works specifically, it's useful to see in more detail how children are depicted throughout Jackson's adult fiction. In a way, she anticipates a popular theme of evil children that begins to come out of the mid 20th century fiction with novels such as William March's The Bad Seed and its attendant theatrical and cinematic adaptations or John Wyndham's The Midwich Cuckoos, later filmed as Village of the Damned. Dominic Leonard in his book, Bad Seeds and Holy Terrors, charting the appearance of child villains in horror films, writes in his introduction, with a subconscious nod to the lottery, as, an obs as in an obsessive ritual, we assure and reassure ourselves with visions of the innocent child, the little wonder, the beautiful victim, the cutie pie rebel whose diminutive insurrections come more as flattery of our own power than a challenge to it. He goes on to suggest that the tables begin to turn mid-century within the genre of horror films, but I'd go further and suggest that Jackson's depictions of children in her work helps point the way. Kids of various ages, especially girls and young women, are featured characters in all of her novels, including prominently in her debut novel, 1948's The Road Through the Wall. Set in an insular neighborhood in Jackson's birth state of California, the novel relates over the course of numerous interactions between members of the various families living there, the narrow-mindedness that infects such modern American environs, ultimately ending in tragic results with, uh, within the course of a scant 200 plus pages. Only mildly appreciated at the time, the book has grown in reputation over the decades as an early demonstration of Jackson's ability to present a dark satire that is genuinely disturbing. Most of the novel's action is initiated by the female characters, ranging from the gossiping mothers to their wily young daughters. The parents, while clearly no paragons of progressive behavior, are at least almost always referred to by their last names, Mrs. Desmond, Mrs. Byrne, and so on, ostensibly befitting their status as adults, while the children are almost nearly called by their first names. That is, when they're not being called young animals or like an ape, their slippery behavior is frequently suspected by their parents, but much of their transgressive activity is left for the reader's eyes only. For instance, regarding the elderly Mrs. Mack, Jackson writes, the children called her a witch and the parents called her an unfortunate old woman, demonstrating in microcosm the difference between the generation's attitudes. Although the narrator also then winkingly admits, and she looked like either one. Although the more generous of mothers defends the children's behavior as not that serious, invoking King Lear's condition of being more sinned against than sinning, the morbid conclusion to the novel suggests that something is genuinely wrong among the children of Pepper Street. Published the same year as The Road Through the Wall, Jackson's short story, Charles, was the first of her semi-autobiographical stories of her own children's escapades. Originally published in Mademoiselle magazine and a occasional destination for her stories, and later included in her quintessential short story collection, The Lottery, the following year. It was also later incorporated into Jackson's first of two book-length memoirs of her family life, 1953's Life Among the Savages, 
which along with its 1957 follow-up, remains among her most commercially successful books. While clearly exaggerated for both dramatic and humorous effect, Jackson presents the fictionalized version of her son, Laurie, as imaginative almost to a fault, able to construct an artificial fall guy for his own misconduct. Laurie's frequent sassiness towards his parents at home, not to mention the outright lie of Charles' existence, suggests the potentially corrupting influence of Charles's apocryphal abusive behavior towards his teacher and his classmates. But when we learn in the final sentence of the story that Charles is only a figment, we can be excused for being at least a little concerned for the child's good future good judgment. In this case, context matters. Where reading the story in the pages of Mademoiselle or among the other droll follies described in Jackson's memoirs, makes clear the humorous side of such childish mis misdeeds. But when placed among Jackson's most unnerving work in her short story collection, the tale can be easily viewed through a more ambiguous, less comfortable lens. Other stories such as The Witch and even The Lottery show children, if not initiating the actual misdeeds, at least willingly participating in them. Jackson's, oops, Jackson's 1958 one-act play, The Bad Children, began somewhat in opposition to this trend. Written to provide an original piece for her children to perform at school, she subverted the traditional story of Hansel and Gretel, a story which Jackson said she couldn't stand because the children were, are never truly punished for their effrontery of eating the witch's gingerbread house. In her amusingly modern, modern take on the story, the witch is essentially harmless and merely seeks to keep the kids from destroying her home. But even when their parents appear, they seem perfectly happy to have the brats be someone else's responsibility for a while. The twist comes once the children, having had their fill of gingerbread, question, wait a minute, who's going to make our dinner? They promise to be good children if they can only go back to the way things were, which ironically unnerves the parents even further. Ultimately, Jackson's attempt to provide a moral to what she perceived as the faults of the original tale doesn't stick. As she noted, I did make one attempt to rescue the play. I quickly wrote an ending by which, in which by means of magic, Hansel and Gretel are transformed into sweet, dear, good, kind little kitties. But the children threw it right out again. Hansel and Gretel stay horrible to the end. When in 1962, she was invited to write a children's picture book, she produced Nine Magic Wishes, an appropriately simple and fantastical tale where a child encounters a magician who offers her nine wishes. It should be noted that the child's gender is not specified in the text, but in a posthumous later edition illustrated by Jackson's own grandson, Miles Hyman, she's depicted as a girl. The experience of writing the book proved to be rewarding for Jackson, allowing her to work against the trend that she accused most contemporary children's books of falling into, as expressed in the aforementioned essay from the reporter. With Nine Magic Wishes, Jackson gets the chance to be completely whimsical, while successfully avoiding the trope of the malicious child, as the girl wishes for things like a miniature private zoo and a flying silver ship that people would mistake for a bird. These things are not selected to be overly ostentatious or displaying a selfish intent. In fact, she declines the final wish, which the magician leaves behind for someone else to happen upon. She is portrayed as an imaginative child who merely desires to amuse herself without impending on anyone else's activities. On the other hand, the title character of Jackson's follow-up children's book, 1963's Famous Sally, which is also among the final completed works of fiction produced in her lifetime, the character is less self-sacrificing. With the exaggeration typical of children's literature, she feels that no one in the world knew Sally's name and that her solution to this curse of anonymity is to make the people in all the cities say my name. While traveling through such fairy tale metropolises as Tall City, Soft City, and Rose City, whose names are selected by Jackson's daughter, Sarah, who was consulted for the book, Sally concocts ways to announce herself to the various populations via kites, talking dolls, the whispering wind, and so on. 
but nothing more than her name. Not a statement of her achievements or future plans, but just her name. And even though she receives permission from a friendly turtle to paint her name on his shell while he travels through Slow City, today we might blanch at what feels like a selfish abuse of nature. Ultimately, this subtext would undoubtedly go over the heads of any young readers who would more likely find the book a quaint but amiable tale of empowerment and problem solving. But Jackson's editors didn't respond to it very enthusiastically, leading it to remain unpublished until 1966, a year after Jackson's death. <clears throat> it does seem that Jackson could not help but present kids as something akin to not yet fully formed adults in their motivations and ethics. Thus, with her non-fictional account of the Salem Witch Trials commissioned in 1953 by celebrity editor Bennett Cerf for his landmark series of history books aimed at young teens, the girls who feign being bewitched by Tichuba and other outsider figures of the community are equally culpable with the male authority figures who seek to make a name for themselves by defeating the imagined diabolic scourge. With typical bluntness, Jackson comments, if Thomas Putnam had refused to sign the first complaint and had gone home and then spanked his daughter instead, the Salem witchcraft trials might never have happened. But until the deadly furor finally exhausts itself, adults and children alike go along with their illogical and consequential actions, much as they do in Jackson's most bracing story, The Lottery. In a 1956 letter to her agent, as cited in the incredibly valuable collection of Shirley Jackson's letters published earlier this year, she expresses an anxiety about her seeming inescapable focus on the subject of childhood, even though her family memoirs have proven to be her most lucrative work. As she writes, I want to do some stories not about kids. Would anybody want them, do you think? The kind I used to write before I hit this load, which I think is pretty well worked out now. Or has my name gotten itself so identified with this family stuff that a new kind of story would flop? Although she's referring specifically to her memoir work, her depictions of children, whether in their imitation of adult misbehavior or out of their own distorted sense of propriety, reappears throughout her work, even including her writing for younger readers. But a final children's novel, the Fair Side of Far was begun just before her death. Sadly, it has been lost, so there's no way to tell if Jackson might have been attempting to approach a more optimistic view of things, much as she seems to have been attempting with her unfinished adult novel, Come Along With Me. Thus, it's hard not to believe that the savages may have won out. But if we look deeper at her work for children, we can see a powerful desire to celebrate the imagination, both in both its wondrous and more dangerous forms. I thank you for your attention.